Hello, welcome to the Stoneham Memorial Seventh Day Adventist Church on Nobility Hill, Stoneham, Massachusetts. Our congregation has been serving the greater Boston area for more than 100 years through ministry, education, and community service. You can find out more about us at our website, stonehammemorialchurch.org, or by visiting us in person at 29 Maple Street. We thank you and hope you feel God's presence as you join us for our weekly church service. Service. Good morning. Welcome, church family. Happy Sabbath, and we are so happy to see you all here today. And we pray that God is with our young people as they're meeting downstairs. There's a teen and youth church happening downstairs, and we pray for God's blessing upon them. Well, this morning I just have a few announcements uh, I would just like to share with you quickly. Uh, everyone experiences grief or bereavement at some time. And there'll be a time for questions and how to process that at Ask a Doctor. Uh, you can actually send in your questions as soon as possible. Uh, you can use the QR code or the URL. The deadline is coming on Tuesday, April 16. So this week, plan to join us to learn more about this important topic on the 20th at 2 p.m. When Dr. Nicole, our own, very own psychiatrist, uh, will answer your questions and help us to process some of these important issues. Also, I'd like to inform you that this Friday night coming, we have a very special Vespers. Friday night, some of our families gather together here in the church at 7 p.m. And we have a wonderful time in fellowship, and we are going to be looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls. Can you trust the Bible? I really am looking forward to that. Well, Stoneham or SMC as some people know it, stands for Stoneham Missionary Church. Is that right? <laughs> Stoneham Memorial Church, but sometimes I think we should also be known as Stoneham Missionary Church. Do you know one of our very own, uh, Andy, the Huntsakers, uh, they are away and they run, uh, help to lead out an ASI which is a wonderful missionary organization. We have a missionary, amen. But not only that, did you know that at least three of our young people today are in Cuba as missionaries, amen. Did you know that we have members in this church that share the love of Jesus with their neighbors? They are missionaries, amen. And if you're not a missionary, it can start by sharing the love of Jesus with others. Something small. So Stoneham Memorial Church is also known as Stoneham Missionary Church. Amen. Well, I want to read before I leave this podium and get in more trouble. Uh, Psalm 67, Psalm 67, and this is what it says. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee that thy way may be known upon the earth, thy saving health among all nations. Our God is a missionary God, and our church is a missionary church, sharing the love of Jesus. May God bless us as we grow with Him more and more. Oh, there's one more. There is the second reading. Do you want to hand it to me? On your bulletins. And uh, so please be aware that, would you like me to move it now? Oh, for the organizing committee. So this is the second reading. If you would like to look at the names of the organizing committee. So please uh, take note of that. Thank you so much. One of the biggest misunderstandings of our culture is the belief. So I'd just like to ask if someone would like to move. Is there a seconder? All in favor? Any opposed? 
Thank you. One of the biggest misunderstandings of our culture is the belief that success comes before happiness. Many of us believe that once we lose the weight, get the girl, buy that house, drive that car, or sit in that corner office, then we will find happiness there. But research shows that this is simply untrue. Scientifically speaking, happiness comes before success. But how can we catch happiness? According to one researcher, there are five relationships that hold the key to happiness in life. A cheerleader, a mentor, a coach, a friend, and a peer. Jim Rohn is known as saying, you are the average of the five people you associate with the most. Who are you associating with? Who are those people that you surround yourself with? And do they push you and move you in a direction towards your dreams? The Bible tells the story of a paralyzed man who had four people who were critical to him experiencing the healing so needed in his life. These four friends carried the palsied man to a house where Jesus was staying. They were stifled by an immense crowd from reaching Jesus, so they decided to go through the roof. Their faith in Jesus' ability to heal their friend and their passion for his healing led to an encounter with Christ. They would not be denied. An encounter that left the man forgiven and walking out of that house on his own two feet. Do you have people like that in your life? People who carry you when you're unable to carry yourself? A team who will meet the obstacles to your dreams with you? A support group that may not have all the answers to your healing themselves, but are willing to take you to someone who does. You see, it's time to trust. It's time to accept that we will not make it on this health journey on our own. Yes, we were made to move but not to move on our own, and sometimes by the strength of others. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Let's start off with uh, hymn 343, one of my favorites. It's uh, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. We're going to sing all stanzas.
Now, if you'll turn with me to hymn 336, we are going to sing stanzas one through three and then stanza six. with me for our opening hymn, hymn 337, Redeemed. Thank you. 
be seated. Okay, now it's time for all the children to come forward. Okay, happy Sabbath. Maybe you can move backward because I want to show you something in the screen, okay? It's about my superhero, okay? And let me see. Okay, I will sit beside you so... All of us can watch there. So today, um, what do you think is my superhero? Oh, this is for babies. <laughs> okay, so maybe you can see Marshall, Rubble. I love it. You love it? Okay. Oh, maybe these ones. Oh. Yes, Black Panther, Captain America, Thor, wow. Or maybe these four guys. Yes, but you know, I will tell you about my superhero, the one who is strongest, okay? And let's see this Superman, wow, he's carrying a card, and he's carrying something heavy over here. Yes, so is he my superhero? No. What do you think? No. What about this one? Wow. Look at her face. Wow, it's something really, really heavy what she's carrying. Oh, maybe this green guy. Oh, wow. No, okay, but you know, this one is my superhero. The one who carried the, the world in his hand. And you know, he not only carried the world in his hand, he likes and he loves to carry each one of you in his hands. He says, I made you. And I will care for you. I will carry you along and save you. So, wow. And sometimes, you know, superheroes come when we are in troubles. So, when each one of us are in troubles, 
what do we do? Oh, we use that for calling the Paw Patrols and they will come or maybe we do this sign and then that guy will come. What we have to do is just pray. If we pray like this boy, for sure, our superhero will come. God is a refuge and a strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. Okay? And he will hold our hands and he will help us to overcome that. So, now, I want to tell you that our superhero is with us. Even when he's in heaven right now, he says, I will go and prepare a place for you and I will return to take you with me for the eternity. And we will spend time with our superhero. Enjoying beautiful time, listen all the stories that he will tell us and for sure he will carry us on his shoulders and he is really, really fun. We will spend really, really nice time with him because he is our super hero. Okay? So let's remember that, that he is with us. He say, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Does anyone want to pray? You want to pray? Si, si. You want to pray? Thank you. Dear Jesus, thank you that we have church. Thank you for everything that you give us. Thank you that we thank you that we have houses in mom and dad's amen amen okay so remember that jesus is our super hero okay so now let's go to our seat Happy Sabbath, everyone. How are you? Love your smiles. Thank you. Before we um, have the offering, Earl and I would like to um, talk to you about a special lady. Um, she was a member of our church, and uh, she brought her husband, Gary. So we're happy to have Gary here, too. Gary, you want to stand up, please? Yes, please. This is Gary, this, this is uh, Sylvana's husband. Unfortunately, uh, our dear lady died uh, a couple weeks ago. Earl and I and Fred uh, Christensen were able to attend a beautiful sermon and service that uh, was there. A lovely lady, as you see up on the screen. Um, she loved the Lord. She loved the Lord and um, at the uh, the funeral that we went to, there were at least a hundred people there. She had touched their lives and um, in many ways. But I just wanted to give our love and our friendship to Gary. It's very difficult for him. But we know that the Lord is watching over her, Gary. You don't have to worry about that. She's asleep and waiting for the Lord to come. Thank you so much for coming today. And Gary wants to thank everybody that contributed to her uh, GoFund and uh, all those that sent cards and, and best wishes. And she was a, a beautiful lady and she died so suddenly. And that's just uh, for us to realize that 
today could be our last day. Life is very fragile, and, and Gary just wants to thank you all for uh, being loving and kind. Thank you. Our offering message today is um, concerning the Hope Channel International Incorporated. The impact of Hope Channel is evident. Earl and I watch it uh, almost every Friday night, and um, there's so many wonderful programs, and many people have been brought to the Lord through this um, wonderful station. It's evident in the inspiring stories of God's children, like Pastor Ross. You may have seen him on um, Doug Batchelor's uh, programs and sermons, and his and Ross's um, baby, Aurora, who had some medical issues as soon as she was born. So he's gone through a hard, hard time. However, because of the Hope Channel um, and the prayers coming through the Hope Channel, the baby is well and healed miraculously. That was just an one occasion where the Hope Channel does pray for people who are in need. With your offering today, Hope Channel can continue to share the transformational love of Jesus Christ with people all over the world by producing high quality Christian content to reach new audiences in innovative ways. Our Hope Study platform is online and offers Bible studies on a range of topics. So far, 300 million people started a course just one year after the platform went live. Can you imagine that? People are hungering for Bible truth. As we read in Proverbs 11.25, whosoever brings blessings will be enriched and one who waters will himself be watered. By faithfully supporting the Hope Channel International, you are not only blessing others, but yourself as well by bringing hope to those who need it most and by telling them of the love of Jesus. Amen? We do have uh, boxes that you can put your tithe envelopes in as well as contributions for Hope Channel International. The, uh, the containers in the back, and also if you go through this door, there's another one. So God bless you as you give to the Lord and also to Hope Channel International. Amen. Now it's time for us to uh, think about what we want to talk to God about in our garden of prayer. Just like in a garden, there are different kinds of fruits and vegetables. We have different kinds of prayers that we send up to God. And some of us have a special prayer that we need to present to God this, this morning. So if you would come forward with me and be up here for uh, prayer, but as you're coming forward, there's a hymn that we want you to sing, and that's found on page 671. So if we could... Uh, Sing that while people are coming forward.
if you are able, please kneel before God. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Some people with heavy hearts, some people with glad tidings to thank you. And, but we all have needs in our life, and they're all met by you, Lord. And we just thank you for that. We thank you for our church and that we can come to on Sabbath and different nights of the week to worship and sing praises to your name and lift you up in prayer. We thank you for our new pastor. We ask that you be with him and his family. Continue to be with our pantry and giving out food to hundreds of people every week that need it. And we think of the GBA and all that they're giving out to the children that are going there, the love of Jesus and learning about him in their lives. Bless the, the teachers and all the volunteers there, Lord. We thank you uh, for your son, Jesus, who died for our sins and, and that someday, someday soon, we can all be together and, and we can realize and be with uh, people that have passed away and, and we look forward to that day, Lord. And we just ask that you send the Holy Spirit uh, to be with us today and not only today, but for the rest of the week until next Sabbath. And we just ask that uh, you give joy to our hearts and answer our prayers in the time that you know they should be answered. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, church family. Uh, happy Sabbath. Scripture reading this morning is found in the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 1 John, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world.
Hello. Hello. Test. Test. Jesus, you know you're looking below, it's worse now and then. Pushing and shouting, that's crowded by mine. So for my sake, teach me to take one day.
tomorrow may never be mine. Lord, help me today. Show me the way one day at a time. Lord, help me today. Show me the way one day. Aren't you glad you didn't miss that? Amen. Thank you so much for that beautiful music. Uh, I was also thinking of we have a missionary uh, food bank. Amen. What a great team we have there. Well, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, for your presence, we say thank you. For your power, we praise you. And for the cross, all glory goes to you. This day we come and surrender our hearts, our lives, and we pray that you may speak to us in only ways you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Safe in Christ. Well, uh, if we were to go to the Quran, which is not a normal place you'd go for a Christian service, is it? Uh, We would notice what it says here in the Quran. Upon those who believed... And did good works, shall the most gracious God bestow his love. Well, maybe in another surah, you you notice it says, And he, talking about God, answers those who believe and do good works, and gives them more out of his grace. So here what you see is you see that if you believe and you do good works, You receive what? Love. Or you believe and you do good works, you receive more of grace. The question is, is it really love if you have to earn it? Is it really grace if you have to work for it? You see, other religions tend to see righteous acts as meriting or qualifying for God's love and grace. But is it it really love or is it really grace? If we were to go to the Bible, this is what the Bible says. It says, the Lord has appeared of old to me, I mean a long time ago, as saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Before we even knew about God, the Spirit of God was drawing our hearts to Him. God's love, before we could do anything, God's love existed. In fact, before we existed, God's grace existed. So God is the one that performs gracious acts. He is the one that gave the greatest gift God could give Jesus. He achieves righteousness by living out holiness in the flesh. He then gifts it to those who believe. Now, the truth of, and we have been largely looking at justification over the last few weeks. And what is justification? It is the moving from we being under condemnation through the death of Christ and through the merits of Jesus Christ by turning away from the world and choosing to make Him our all, moving from condemnation to being in this right relationship with God. Why? Because of what Jesus has achieved. And this truth had been perverted in the dark ages. A perversion of the work of the cross and God's gracious gift. It's a rejection of the sufficiency that Christ is enough. And it became man focused. You see, religion, all false religion, becomes man's way to God. 
True religion is how God came to man. In the religious world, there's two sources of righteousness. There's our own righteousness or righteousness by the law. And this is, when I want to make this clear, this is in order to be right with God, in order to appease God. But then there's the righteousness of God, what Jesus lived out. Notice here, we go to a story in Matthew chapter 22, and a beautiful little parable, and they're trying to get people to come to a party and come to the banquet. And, and, and here we pick up late in the story, we pick up in verse 8, and you can read the rest for homework. It says, then he said to his servants, the king, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was filled with guests. Filled. But when the king goes, he goes now through the, through the wedding banquet. And as he's walking around and he's going through the wedding banquet, but when the king came, comes in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, uh, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. Now, it seems pretty important to me in this parable, eh, that who taught? Jesus. That there ought to be people who intend to be at that banquet wearing the wedding garment. Now, what does it mean when it speaks about the wedding garment? If we were to jump to Isaiah, because Jesus' Bible of the day was the Old Testament, amen. And we were to jump to Isaiah, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bride, this is talking about a wedding. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with the jewels. So, so here we see, if we want to know what is this robe that we're talking about, in the Bible, it was the garments of salvation or the robe of Righteousness. How do I get righteousness? In the marriage theme, there is a clue. Belief, commitment, and love. But I want to take you to our teaching passage, and then we're going to kind of start to break it down. Is that all right? Are you ready? Every passage, because we need a teaching passage. Amen. It's not about what the pastor says. We need to hear it from the Word. And sometimes the Word nudges us into places where we may feel a little bit. Notice what it says here in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Starting in verse 4. Now, now Paul is here. He's talking. And, and I, he's been not sarcastic, but he's been a little bit, you know. He says, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. <laughs> you know, if you think you're pretty good, huh? And you're confident, and, and maybe, maybe you're a fifth, in fact, I heard somebody might be a sixth generation Adventist. Hey? Imagine that. If you're pretty confident in the flesh, maybe you have never missed the Sabbath. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. So what he's saying is if you think you're pretty good, if you think your 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 Israeli, your Jewish heritage kind of is good and makes you an authentic Christian, I more so. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying to them, if you think you're a real deal, and I mean Hebrew, huh? 
Me, I'm more so. Now, he gives his qualifications. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Before he could do anything, as a baby, he was fulfilling the law. Circumcised on the eighth day. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He's giving us his tribe. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. Now, in the original language, when you go to, I don't know what's banging up here. Somebody trying to shoot me, something like that, eh? in trouble already but in the original language you have when you have one you have the word and then you do I need to say oh it's gone it's it just stopped. no it's alive huh? in the original I'll try it one more time and if not I will try and stay still and stick to the landmark okay huh? So in the original language, when you put Hebrew, you've got Hebrew of the Hebrews. You put the word back to back next to each other. It's an intensification of that word. In other words, when he says Hebrew of the Hebrews, it's saying, I was a real deal Hebrew. You follow me? So what he's saying, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I am a real deal thing. No compromise with me. I'm not plastic. Notice, concerning the law, a Pharisee. In other words, every little detail I would do. Concerning zeal, I was so zealous. I was so zealous for God, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law. When you look at the law, that righteousness, I was blameless. So you see him. So he starts off by saying, if you think you were pretty good, me more so. And he starts to articulate all of his qualifications spiritually. That, and, but notice this, he says, but what things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss for Christ. You see, I often used to read this passage, and I read things like where it says, but, but those things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. I would think that he's turning his back on the world. But Paul is saying, I'm not relying upon my spiritual heritage. I'm not relying upon my own righteousness. You following what he's saying? Then he goes on and notice he says, Yet indeed I also count all things lost, everything for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. And notice here it says, and be found in him. Now, I don't know about you, but there's lots of places in the Bible. I used to read the Bible, Bible says, being in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. And I said, what does that even mean? But now I read here, the Bible says, I, he's saying, all of these things I used to rely on, but I don't rely on them anymore. Why? Because I want to be found in Christ Jesus. Now, what does it mean to be found in Christ Jesus? Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. What he's saying is, I'm not relying upon my own righteousness for salvation. Do you see it? But notice it says, but that which is through faith in Christ, whose righteousness? The righteousness which is from God by faith. In other words, he was keeping the law. He was doing all of these things. And he says, no, 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 no. But let me be in Christ Jesus. And what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? It means that I am relying upon what Jesus has done. I'm relying upon that for my salvation. Glory to God. There is a righteousness so high, so pure, so holy that can meet the demands of the law. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we receive it by faith. When we trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, He grants us His righteousness, His blood that washes us. To believe in God's righteousness means you are in 
Christ. When you surrender your efforts to save yourself, you see, sometimes we say, I want Jesus and I love the Lord and he's my God, but we're still relying upon our own efforts to commend us to God. Our efforts glorify God, amen? Our efforts to obey him are wonderful, amen? But they cannot make you acceptable to God, the only righteousness that makes you acceptable to God is whose righteousness? Christ's righteousness. That's the high and the whole. So now when you say, Lord, I accept you, I'm leaning and trusting wholly in your righteousness, wholly in your blood. You are my Savior. My works, that they don't save me, Lord. I'm even going to stop trying to save myself and trust in your salvation. And we accept Jesus as our Savior and rely upon his righteousness. Then we are in Christ. That's what it means. When you surrender your efforts to save yourself, and accept Jesus' merits, you receive the righteousness of God, and God looks down, and he doesn't see Peter. He sees Peter covered in the, he sees, but he's covered in the righteousness of Christ. He looks over to Kathy over there, and she's not trusting in her own righteousness, even though she's doing lots of good works, amen? But she's covered in a more perfect righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. Paul acquired righteousness. To be in Christ is to refuse to rely upon your own righteousness. This involved counting as nothing all of his good efforts for salvation. There's one person's efforts that saves us, and that's Christ. It involved 100% dependency upon Christ. It received by faith Christ and the righteousness of Christ. Now, notice what happens then. These promises become true to you because then the Bible says something like, but of him, you are in Christ Jesus. This is for you. And he becomes for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That is, it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Why is he glory? Jesus has become for him wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, but it's through what he has done. You know, I used to go shopping. I still like to go shop. Well, I shop sometimes, and I went to this particular shop. And at this shop, and Lord help me, you know, the pastor is not always an example, amen? But uh, I went there, and there was someone at the grocery checkout who used to annoy me. Did anyone, you guys, none of you people don't have people in your lives that annoy you, hey? And uh, I would go there, and every time she, she would nag me, if I would take a bag, she would get upset. You know, she, I don't know, she, she was saving the planet or whatever it was. And, and I had all of these things in my trolley, and, and I was trying to avoid her, and I saw her, and she saw me. And I went, oh, she had the shortest line, so I went down there. And, and, and as I went down the aisle, and, and, and I looked at her, and she looked at me, and then we started putting things through the grocery, and as we started putting the groceries through, at the end, she looked at me, and she said, do you want a bag? <laughs> now, I don't know, she think I'm going to put it all on my head, you know? A lot of food. And I said, yes, I want a bag. And she went, <sighs> and she turned away and got down her bag, and my, you know, my, I won't say my holy, but my temperature started to rise, eh? And as my temperature started to rise, I said, Lord, help me. And I just felt cool down. Praise the Lord, I cooled down. Amen? Amen. Walked out of that store, even though I, I kind of felt like I should have given her a piece of my mind. Came in not long after, another day. And as I came to the counter, this time I was going to avoid her. But as I was going past her aisle, she said, Pastor Clifton, Pastor Clifton. She knew I was a pastor. She had been reading. We had just taken a group to Africa and we'd come back and she saw on the paper, we had a you know, photo. She said, oh, Pastor Clifton, I come down my aisle. So I went down her aisle and she started to tell me how her grandfather was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. Amen. Can you imagine if my flesh was allowed to fix her, you know? She still messages me even to this day. 
You know, when we're in Christ, it's not just a legal thing. Something inside us, we start to get new impulses, new desires. Look at something else you can rejoice at in in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are where? In Christ Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. What about this one? Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man what? Perfect where? In In Christ Jesus. Now, there is a type of righteousness. Remember Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You remember that? And you would look at the scribes and Pharisees, and they would wear these perfect gowns, not a spot on them, and they'd have these tassels on and Bible verses and all of these things, and they would walk around, and they would just look holy. And, as, and, and Jesus says, unless, and every little thing. Remember, they would tithe at a, at a mint and a cum, and all the little herbs that, that do everything, and, and as they do all of these things. Now Jesus comes along and the hearers are thinking, hang on a second, our righteousness has to be more than them? But it doesn't finish there, Matthew 5. Also goes into Matthew 6, doesn't it? And it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and, and His Righteousness. There is a righteousness so high and pure and holy that Jesus died for you to have, and that's the righteousness of Christ. The Pharisees had an external righteousness. Internal, there were issues. Jesus had an internal, amen? And it bubbled out, and you could see it. Pharisees were so focused on rules. Jesus was focused on love. Now, by the way, don't think love has no rules. Amen. But it works from the inside out. The Pharisees were focused. The word Pharisee, parish, or to separate. They were focused on separating themselves from things that can contaminate. Jesus was incarnated so he could come down and be with us. The Pharisees were were so focused on sin and contamination. But Jesus, he spoke about sin, gospel also, and life. In fact, I was there in Sydney, Australia, and I was working at at, at the church next to the hospital, Sydney Adventist Hospital. And we had been going to see this uh, gentleman, and I caught the elevator up, and as I came out the elevator, there was the stairway, and right next to the stairway was a Jewish gentleman. He had the, you know, these hats. He didn't have one of those on, but he had the, and uh, those hats, by the way, one of them just got stolen in New York, I heard, I saw on the news. Cost $8,000 each, Shabbat hat for Sabbath, hey? Eh? I might need one in winter. But anyway, as I looked at him on the door, I said, I was excited. Here he was. I said, Shabbat Shalom. I'm a Sabbath keeper too. I was so excited. And he looked at me and he said, I have just walked from St. Ives to be here. It's rather a strange type of response, don't you think? You know what he was, now at first I was a bit slow. Now I'm a bit slow, so forgive me church. eh? What he was really saying was, oh, you're a Sabbath keeper. My Sabbath keeping and your Sabbath keeping, not the same. Then I said, see, I missed it at first. And I started saying, oh, would you, we would love to learn about the Passover. And, you know, I started talking to him. And before I knew it, the conversation was gone. And he had gone his way. God bless him, amen. And I went my way. There is... Maybe should I just shift to this one? I don't know what's happening. Are you going to give me a new one? At least no one's trying to shoot me.
I will make the... There is an increasing pressure on understanding of how we are made right with God. We are living in a time where the truths of Scripture discovered at the time of the Reformation are being lost. Whose righteousness? How do we attain the necessary robe of righteousness? Notice what Alan White says, and we're going to go further. The next session, we're going to deal with how to have victory in our lives. Is that important? Amen. But notice this, the law demands righteousness, and this the sinner owes to the law, but is incapable of rendering it. We don't have it. Christ has it. When we are in Christ, we receive power. Now, now we read verse 9, but notice in verse 10, it says, this is continuing on. After being found in Christ, not relying on my righteousness, the righteousness of the law, but relying upon the righteousness of God uh, by faith. In verse 10, it says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. In other words, when we're in Christ, we start to experience resurrection power. When we put Christ first, the Spirit of God starts to work in our hearts and we start to experience resurrection power in the life. When we die, and we often think about dying to sin, but we need to die to self in the sense that we must die to our efforts to save ourselves and trust wholly in His salvation. When we do that, new impulses, new desires, and power comes into the life. Jesus says, if this bit of corn falls to the ground, it's only when we die. It's not just dying to the world, it's dying to our efforts to save ourselves. Now, in the islands, and even the islands up here, they, there is a wonderful plant. In fact, if you could choose a plant to live off, you may choose this plant. You can use it for roofing. Did you know that? For roof on the huts. You can use it for pillars in the house. You can even eat it. You can drink it. You can even use it for a bra if you really want. Huh? You know what I'm talking about? The coconut. Huh? And the coconut, you know, when it's on the tree, it's up there. And when it's connected to the branch, it's sucking life out of the branch. And, and, and it's alive and it's living and it's growing. But it gets to a phase where it drops from the branch. And when it drops to the, to the ground and it starts to die. Isn't that right? It dies. There's no more energy. There's no more life coming into it. And inside the coconut, some of you from the West Indies or where there's coconut trees, you may, uh, you may know inside it starts to, it has this white stuff that grows inside of it. In our islands, it's called utu. And if you can imagine a thin, sweet polystyrene, you know? Can you imagine eating that? It tastes nice. Well, kind of. It dies. But when it dies, then something happens. New life sparks. And a shoot goes down that becomes the roots. And a shoot comes up that will eventually become the stem. Only when it dies. And when we die to our attempts to save ourselves, we die to the world and we trust in what Jesus has done. New life springs inside the Christian heart the power of the resurrection. And we receive new desires, new impulses, new thoughts, things we loved, we start to dislike. And things we disliked, we start to love. We're born again. But it must be rooted on trusting wholly in the salvation of Christ. When we have faith in what he has done, 
when we realize that we cannot produce righteousness and rely on his righteousness, we experience resurrection power and we start to keep God's law and we start to honor God and love our neighbor and things we used to dislike, we we start to like. I want to take you here to 1 John, and I'm not finishing for a little bit, but that's going to be okay. 1 John chapter 2. Because what happens if I sin? Is that important? I've given my life to Christ. I'm relying upon his righteousness. He is my Lord and Savior. What happens if I sin? Notice this Bible verse. In verse 1, it says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not. Now, is it God's desire that we sin? No. Doesn't want any of us to sin. But it says, And if anyone sins, but if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Who's the advocate? Jesus Christ. And what's his attribute? The righteous. If we sin, doesn't mean we fall away from God. Amen? He's our advocate, and we say, Lord, and we turn in repentance to our Lord and Savior. Lord, you love me. Lord, have mercy upon me. And sometimes we are harder on ourselves than God is on us. Often we help the devil. You know, the devil's trying to beat us up. We feel guilty. We do a mistake, and we start beating ourselves up. We help the devil, hey? But Jesus is there, loving us. Notice Ellen White says it in a different way. She says, if through manifold temptations, if through many many temptations, we are surprised or deceived into sin, he does not turn from us and leave us to perish. No, no, that is not like our Savior. Is that beautiful? Amen. So if you make a mistake, now I'm not saying make mistakes, Amen. We ought to fight and scratch and kick to honor God. Amen. We ought to think this thing out and and spend time to build ourselves up spiritually, keep our eyes fixed on the glories of the cross, on the righteousness of Jesus, rejoicing in the blood of the Lamb, and making up our minds that we're going to walk with Jesus every day of our lives. But if we stumble and we fall, don't beat ourselves up. Trust in Him. Because He has a righteousness that is good enough. He is so committed to you. Well, in 1888, there was one class who saw this, and Alan White was one of them, and they believed this needed to be introduced into every aspect of the work, all the doctrines, everything. There was another class who they sat on the fence. They didn't know what to think. And there was a third class who opposed it and thought if we start emphasizing this, we are going to take away from our distinct doctrines. Friends, I believe in all our teachings, amen, that God has given this church, amen? They're more powerful in the light of the cross. In the religious world, there's two sources of righteousness. Our own righteousness or righteousness by the law, it's not good enough. Doesn't mean we ought not to live for the glory of God. But, but, but there is a righteousness we receive by faith. And when we receive it, it starts to transform us. And our hearts change. And we start to give glory to God. And we start to live our lives. And we grow more and more and more to the glory of God. But it must start on relying upon Him. Here's, uh, as we get close to finishing off, here's one of my last verses, my last passage. In Christianity, we have Jesus. He is powerful. Notice this. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has what? Life. If you have the Son, you have what? Life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may... Know that you have eternal life. 
and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Today, if we have turned from our own efforts to save ourselves, if we've said, Lord, the world is not good enough, you are the best, I want you, and we turn from the world, and we trust in Jesus, and today I claim Jesus as my own, for he has given himself to us, and we know we have the Son, we can know today that we have eternal life. If you have Jesus today, amen, you have eternal life. You know, I, at college, I was a bit cheeky. I'm still a bit cheeky. Lord, help me, amen. And I had one lecturer, and we would often disagree and have arguments in front of the class, but he loved me, and I loved him, amen. And we were going this particular day to all of the different religions. Well, not all. We were going to see the Mormons and the Muslims and, and, and some other denominations. And he said, Clifton, on our trip, you, I've got one thing that I need to tell you. You are banned from talking. <laughs> he wasn't letting me talk. Eh? He was scared that I was going to start some trouble with some of the other. Well, so I went there and I was just sitting there, you know, holding my tongue when they'd say some interesting thing. But we went to a particular mosque. It was Lakemba Mosque. And when we went to Lakemba Mosque, uh, I remember asking the imam. wasn't me, somebody else. They asked the imam. They said to him, how do you know whether you're saved or you're lost? And I'll never forget it. He said, we live in a place between hope and fear. We're always hoping we're good enough but we're always fearful that we're not. Friends, this is not Christianity. If you give yourself wholly to Christ, amen, today you can know you belong to Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that you can cherish your idols and all that. No, you've got to say, Lord, you're more important than those, amen? And turn your back. Make him first. But you can know. Now, you may not have power to stop doing some of these things, but if you say, Lord, I'm turning and I'm believing in you, I don't know how I'm going to stop, but I'm going to step out in faith and I'm going to choose you today. Today you have eternal life. Because what he does is like the man who was on the ground. He hadn't walked. Jesus says, rise up and walk. And he's lying on the mat. His legs could not physically uh, make him walk. But Jesus said, right. All he, all he could do was perhaps move the leg just a little bit. So he said, oh, well, Lord, I can't move them, but I'm going to start moving them. And as he moved them, each little bit, God enabled him to move them a little more. It's like saying, if you're, if you're struggling with something, you may say, I can't quit. Just start trying to quit and trust in God, amen? And you may think, there's no way. I remember I came into the church and I said, Lord, how am I going to stop drinking? And I started to project two years without alcohol. Impossible. God said, I'm not asking you to stop for two years. Give yourself to me today. If, you, if I have you today, if you step out in faith today, he starts to give you power. Uriah Smith rejected much of this in the early days. But praise God, Alan White started praying for him and eventually he turned back. Amen. As one account says, she said of him, he fell on the rock and was broken. Elder Smith didn't accept immediately. Why? Maybe it was pride. I don't know. There were others. Maybe, we, maybe it was sin. Maybe his, his achievements. Maybe some of the people who rejected, maybe they felt for some weird reason unworthy. I, I, I don't understand. Maybe we, we know that what we are like and we say it can't be that easy to receive Jesus and receive his perfect righteousness. Jesus marveled at the centurion who said, just say the word. And he believed. Today will you believe in the words of Jesus. Amen. Will you trust wholly in him? God has provided exactly what we need. And he invites us to believe. 
I want to tell you a story before I close, and this is the last story. We lived in, where we lived in Auckland, there's two coasts, fairly close together. In fact, probably you have to drive, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes to see water, the ocean. And there was this one particular beach. It's a dangerous beach. It's called Piha. In fact, many people die there. Often a lot of people who, who come to New Zealand for a holiday or first immig- come as immigrants to New Zealand, they end up, there's many people who die there because it's a very, very, uh, you, you don't pick it, but there's huge rips and, and it's just, you know, we have people being sucked under just, you know, up to their waist and get dra- pop up a couple of hundred meters out in the ocean. Well, as young boys do, and don't do what I do, (laughs) there is a big rock called Lion's Rock. And along the beach, down to the left, there's another rock. And when you go and look at that rock, inside it was hollow. And big waves would come crashing through, and they would suck out. And so I, I went there with a friend, Ray, and we'd catch the waves, we'd go into the... But on the other side, it was vast ocean. And so we would catch the wave, and it would drag us and pull us, and what we would do is we'd kind of cling to the side of the rock, and then another wave would come. Well, this particular day, it was, used to be me and Ray used to go, we said, let's take Tom. Now, I won't say Tom was... Um, not intelligent, I'll just say, you know those friends who are just doesn't, don't seem as quick as everybody else? You know those friends? Don't look to your neighbor. Well, Tom was there, and Tom came with us, and we went in, and we said, Tom, this is going to be awesome. Tom was so excited, and we said, let's do it. And then this huge wave came. We said, Tom, catch the wave. We caught the wave, and we started screaming, woohoo! We're catching the wave, and as we're catching the wave, and we start propelling forward, and now as the wave starts to lose its push, it starts to suck out. And this is the time as it started to pull out, and because it was a big wave, it seemed extra strong, and it started to pull so strongly, and and Ray went to the side, and he grabbed hold of the rock, and I went to the other side, and I grabbed hold of the rock, and we looked at Tom, and Tom was swimming. But as Tom is swimming, his eyes are starting to, and then I started to think, I don't know, for some reason, Tom's mom crossed my mind. So I thought, hey, and I grabbed hold of one hand like that, and I reached out my other arm. I said, Tom, grab my hand, and Tom's hand slipped. And then two hands, I kicked out my legs, Tom, grab my legs, and he couldn't grab my legs. And then I threw my, then he went and we said, Tom, grab the rock. And then he threw himself against the rock and he scraped up against it, but just managed to grab hold of the rock. And then another wave came. And that was the last time Tom followed us into a rock. I want to share with you, in this life, there are waves that will wash you away. But there is something solid that will keep you, amen? Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Satan can never wash it away. And if you will lean and grab hold of the rock of Jesus, you will be saved. Today I encourage you. He calls us to trust and accept his righteousness. Look to the cross and believe. Real righteousness is found in Jesus. Today, will you trust in Christ and his righteousness? Let's pray. Father in heaven, in our hearts, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that there is a righteousness that meets the demands of the law. There is a righteousness, true and holy, that you long to cover your children with. You don't want us to leave the banquet. You long for us to appreciate and to know what you have done for us. And we rejoice in your salvation. Help us to understand, Lord, your great love. And help us, Lord, not to hold on to the things of the world or even hold on to our own way of salvation, trying to earn our way, but to fully lean on you. May your spirit be in this place. 
May your anointing be upon our children downstairs. But give us life and energy and revival. In Jesus' name we praise you. Amen. Let's have our benediction prayer. Father in heaven, we rejoice in you, Lord. May we be covered with your life, Lord Jesus. May as you hold out your robe, may we receive it, may we accept it. May we trust wholly in you as our Lord and Savior. And Lord, make us born again. Bring life and newness. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your blessing. And help us as we go our way to tell of the glorious goodness of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Testing, testing.